before we get into Paul's letters, uh, his undisputed writings, let's talk a bit about uh, some writers that are contemporary with him. Uh, a lot of people may have may think that Paul was the first to have this crazy idea that if a righteous person suffered, you know, someone that was completely righteous, that somehow that made an atonement for someone who is unrighteous. Uh, and, you know, from today's logical standards, I mean, it, 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 we wouldn't really call that justice for a righteous person to take the place of an unrighteous person. Like, you know, if my if my brother kills someone, I can't go to prison for him. <clears throat> That's not really justice. So where did Paul get this crazy idea that, you know, uh, that Jesus' death could be an atoning sacrifice for our unrighteousness? Okay, so the speculative, speculative theory has been proposed that um, Paul got this crazy idea, this crazy notion of a suffering servant, a person that uh, died to redeem others, possibly from contemporary writers in that time, namely the Maccabees. Um, since it's speculative, I'm going to offer my speculation back, and um, I would argue it's as, every bit as plausible, and in some cases I might argue it's more likely than this theory that's being proposed by a religion-free deist. Um, first of all, Paul tells in his own writings uh, of a roadside conversion a miraculous bright light where he was blinded and he could hear uh, Jesus Christ himself. Um, this is what basically changed Saul to Paul in the first place. It's what made him go from persecuting the Christian church to becoming one of its front runners and missionaries. Um, so my number one theory is he got the idea that uh, Christ died for everyone's sins from this personal encounter with Christ. But let's just dismiss that for a second. Let's say that never truly happened. We misunderstood what Paul was saying or Paul was just inaccurately reporting it and intentionally lying. Um, we then have the fact that it's recorded in, in the Bible, in Scripture, that Paul though his main ministry was to the Gentiles and not spent uh, with the uh, Twelve um, for the better part of his ministry, he did quite often run into them, he did compare notes with them, he did have discussions with them. Um, and we have, you know, just one example that the Apostles were also teaching this kind of message uh, from 1st Peter 3.18. It reads, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Um, so, <clears throat> if you want to really talk about Paul's contemporaries, you should look towards those that were also preaching Christ died uh, for all, uh, bringing the unrighteous to righteousness. You know, Peter uh, alone was one that actually walked and talked every day for three years with Jesus that was preaching the same thing. Um, so why we need to even speculate that Paul needed an extra biblical source from the Maccabees to come up with this idea is, in my mind, kind of ridiculous. But let's dismiss that as well. So we're setting aside that he had this roadside, personal, miraculous experience with Jesus Christ himself. We're setting aside he had exposure to the men that walked and talked with him every day for three years, okay? This is a, a Jew, I mean hardcore Jew. He had a claim to fame in his family line and he 
I mean, when he was out persecuting the Christian church, he felt that he had the right to because of his credentials. He had a long list of credentials to be able to put down this rebellious sect that was going against what he had been brought up believing. Um, and so he would have understood the scripture that I'm about to read from the Old Testament. Now, I looked online, and from what I can tell, the book of Isaiah has a little bit of a discrepancy as to when it was written because it covers a spanned history of almost 200 years. It might have even been written by two authors by the same name. So you can even maybe divide the book into 1st Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah. But uh, the earliest contribution uh, was probably written in the early 7th century with the later contributions being in the middle of the 6th century. So here is 600 to 700 years before Christ. I'm going to read you Isaiah 52, 13 till the end of that chapter, and I'm going to pick up on chapter 53 and go to the end. So I'm going to read the whole chapter of 53 and the end of chapter 52. See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. Many were amazed when they saw him, beaten and bloodied, so disfigured one would scarcely know he was a person. And he will again startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not previously been told about. They will understand what they had not heard about. Who has believed our message? To whom will the Lord reveal his saving power? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, sprouting from a root in a dry, sterile ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we were healed. All of us strayed like sheep. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid the guilt and sins on him for us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was, a lamb, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. From prison and trial they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins, that he was suffering their punishment? He had done no wrong, and he had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and fill him with grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children, many heirs. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. I will give him the honor of one who is mighty and great because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among those who were sinners. He bore the sins of many and interceded for sinners. 700 years before Paul and Jesus, we have Isaiah verbatim talking about Jesus suffering, dying, and counting as an atonement for our sins not his own. This concept well predated Paul and the Maccabees, and I would say your theory and speculation on the matter is false.